One of the major selling points of that wholly remarkable travel book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, apart from its relative cheapness and the fact that it has the words Don't Panic written in large, friendly letters on its cover, is its compendious and occasionally accurate glossary. The statistics relating to the geosocial nature of the universe for existence are deftly set out between pages 938,024 and 938,026, and the simplistic style in which they are written is partly explained by the fact that the editors, having to meet a publishing deadline, copied the information off the back of a packet of breakfast cereal, and of course hastily embroidering it with a few footnotes in order to avoid prosecution under the incomprehensibly torturous galactic copyright laws. It is interesting to note that a later and wilier editor sent the book backwards in time through a temporal warp and then successfully sued the breakfast cereal company for infringement of the same laws. Here's an example. The universe and some information to help you live in it. Number one, area, infinite. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy offers this definition of the word infinite. Infinite, bigger than the biggest thing ever and then some. Much bigger than that, in fact. Really amazingly immense. A totally stunning size. Infinity is just so big that by comparison, bigness itself looks really titchy. Gigantic multiplied by colossal multiplied by staggeringly huge. It's the sort of concept we're trying to get across here. Number two, imports. None. It is impossible to import things into an infinite area, there being no outside to import things from. Number three, exports, none. See imports. Number four, population, none. It is known that there are an infinite number of worlds simply because there is an infinite amount of space for them to be in. However, not every one of them is inhabited, therefore there must be a finite number of inhabited worlds. Any finite number divided by infinity is near to nothing as makes no odds, so the average population of all of the planets of the universe can be said to be zero. From this, it follows that the population of the whole universe is also zero, and that any people you may meet from time to time are merely the products of a deranged imagination. Number five, monetary units. None. In fact, there are three freely convertible currencies in the galaxy, but none of them count. You see, the Alteran dollar has recently collapsed and the Ferninium Pobble Bead is only exchangeable for other Ferninium Pobble Beads and the Trijanic Pew has its very own special problems. Its exchange rate of 8 Ningas to 1 Pew is simple enough, but since a Ninga is a triangular rubber coin 6,800 miles across each side, no one has ever collected enough to own 1 Pew. Ningas are not negotiable currency because the galactic banks refuse to deal in fiddling small change. So from this basic premise, it is very simple to prove that the galactic banks are also the product of a deranged imagination. Number six, art, none. The function of art is to hold the mirror up to nature and there simply isn't a mirror big enough. C.1. Number seven, sex, none. Well, In fact, there is an awful lot of this, largely because of the total lack of money, trade, banks, art, or anything else that might keep all the non-existent people of the universe occupied. However, it is not worth embarking on a long discussion of it now, because it really is terribly complicated. For further information, see Guide Chapters 7, 9, 10, 11, 14, 16, 17, 19, 21 to 84 inclusive, and in fact, uh, most of the rest of the guide. The restaurant continued existing, but everything else had stopped. Temporal relostatics held it and protected it in a nothingness that wasn't merely a vacuum. It was simply nothing. There was nothing in which a vacuum could be said to exist. The four-shielded dome had once again been rendered opaque. The party was over, the diners were leaving, Zarquan had vanished along with the rest of the universe, the time turbines were preparing to pull the restaurant back across the brink of time in readiness for the lunch sitting, and Max Claude Lepine was back in his small curtain dressing room trying to raise his agent on the temporal phone. In the car park stood the black ship, closed and silent. Into the car park came the late Mr. Hot Black Desiato, propelled along the moving catwalk by his bodyguard. They descended one of the tubes, and as they approached the Limo ship, a hatchway swung down from its side, engaged the wheels of the wheelchair, and drew it inside. The bodyguard followed and having seen his boss safely connect up to his death support system, moved up to the small cockpit. 
Here, he operated the remote control system, which activated the autopilot in the black ship lying next to the limo, thus causing great relief to the Zaphod Beeblebrox, who had been trying to start the thing for over 10 minutes. The black ship glided smoothly forward out its bay, turned and moved down the central causeway swiftly and quietly, and at the end of it accelerated rapidly and flung itself into the temporal launch chamber and began the long journey back to the distant past. The Milliways launch menu quotes by permission, a passage from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This passage is... The history of every major galactic civilization tends to pass through three distinct and recognizable phases. Those of survival, inquiry, and sophistication, otherwise known as the how, why, and where phases. For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where should we have lunch? The menu goes on to suggest that Milliways, the restaurant at the end of the universe, would be a very agreeable and sophisticated answer to that third question. What it doesn't go on to say is that it will usually take a large civilization many thousands of years to pass through the how, why and where phases. Small social groupings under stressful conditions can pass through them with extreme rapidity. How are we doing? said Arthur Dent. Badly, said Ford Prefect. Where are we going? said Trillian. I don't know, said Zaphod Beeblebrox. Why not? demanded Arthur Brent. Shut up, suggested Zaphod Beeblebrox and Ford Prefect. Basically, what you're trying to say, said Arthur Dent, ignoring this suggestion, is that we're out of control. The ship was rocking and swaying sickeningly as Ford and Zaphod tried to wrest control from the autopilot. The engine howled and whined like tired children in a supermarket. You know, it's the wild colour scheme that freaks me, said Zaphod, whose love affair with the ship had lasted almost oh, three minutes into the flight. Every time you try and operate one of these weird black controls that are labelled in black on a black background, a little black light lights up black to let you know you've done it. What is this? Some kind of galactic hyperhearse? The walls of the swaying cabin were also black. The ceiling was black. The seats, which were rudimentary since the only important trip the ship was designed for was supposed to be unmanned, were black. The control panel was black, the instruments were black, the little screws that held them in place were black, the thin tufted nylon floor covering was black, and when they had lifted up a corner of it, they discovered that the foam underlay also was black. Perhaps whoever designed it had eyes that responded to different wavelengths, offered Trillian. Well, it didn't have much imagination, muttered Arthur. Perhaps, said Marvin. He, he was feeling very depressed. In fact, though they weren't to know it, the decor had been chosen in honour of its owner's sad, lamented and tax-deductible condition. The ship gave a particularly sickening lurch. Take it easy, pleaded Arthur. You're making me space sick. Time sick, said Ford. We're plummeting backwards through time. Thank you, said Arthur. Now I really think I am going to be ill. Go ahead, said Zaphod. We could do with a little bit of colour about this place. This is meant to be a polite after-dinner conversation, is it? Snapped Arthur. Zaphod left the controls for Ford to figure out and lurched over to Arthur. Look, Earthman, he said angrily, you've got a job to do, right? The question to the ultimate answer, right? What, that thing? I thought we'd forgotten about that, said Arthur. Not me, baby. Like the mice said, it's worth a lot of money in the right quarters and it's all locked up in that head thing of yours. Yes, but... But nothing. Think about it, the meaning of life. We get our fingers on that, we can hold every shrink in the galaxy up to ransom. And that is worth a bundle. I owe mine a mint. Arthur took a deep breath without much enthusiasm. All right, he said, but where do we start? How should I know? They say the ultimate answer or whatever is 42. How am I supposed to know what the question is? It could be anything. I mean, what's six times seven? Zaphod looked him hard for a moment. His eyes blazed with excitement. 42, he cried. <sighs> Arthur wiped his palm across his forehead. Yes, he said patiently. I, I know that. Zaphod's faces fell. I'm just saying that the question could be anything at all, said Arthur, and I don't see how I'm meant to know. Because, his Zaphod, you were there when your planet did the big firework. We have a thing on Earth, began Arthur. Had, corrected Zaphod. Uh, called tact. Oh, never mind. Look, 
I just don't know. A low voice echoed dully around the cabin. I know, said Marvin. Ford called out from the controls. He was still fighting a losing battle with... uh, Stay out of this, Marvin, he said. This is organism talk. It's printed in the Earthman's brainwave patterns, continued Marvin. But I don't suppose you'd be very interested in knowing that. You mean, said Arthur, you mean you can see into my mind? Yes, said Marvin. Arthur stirred in astonishment. And... And it amazes me how you can manage to live in anything that small. Ah, said Arthur. Abuse. Yes, confirmed Marvin. Ah, ignore him, said Zaphod. He's only making it up. Making it up, said Marvin, swivelling his head in a parody of astonishment. Why should I want to make anything up? Life's bad enough as it is without wanting to invent any more of it. Marvin, said Trillian in the gentle, kindly voice that only she was capable of assuming in talking to this misbegotten creature. If you knew all along, then why didn't you tell us? Marvin's head swivelled back to her. You didn't ask, he simply said. (sighs) Well, we're asking you now, Metal Man, said Ford, turning around to look at him. At that moment, the ship suddenly stopped rocking and swaying. The engine pitch settled down into a gentle hum. Hey, Ford, said Zaphod, that sounds good. Have you worked out the controls of this boat? No, said Ford. I just stopped fiddling with them. I reckon we just go to wherever the ship is going and get off it fast. Yeah, right, said Zaphod. I could tell you weren't really interested, murmured Marvin to himself, and slumped into a corner and switched himself off. Trouble is, said Ford, that the one instrument in this wily ship that is giving any reading is worrying me. If it is what I think it is, and if it is saying what I think it's saying, then we've already gone too far back into the past, maybe as much as two million years before our own time. Zaphod shrugged. Time is bunk, he said. I wonder who this ship belongs to anyway, said Arthur. Me, said Zaphod. No, who it really belongs to. Really, me, insisted Zaphod. Look, property is theft, right? Therefore, theft is property. Therefore, the ship is mine, okay? Tell that to the ship, said Arthur. Zaphod strolled over to the console. Ship, he said, banging on the panels. This is your new owner speaking to... He got no further. Several things happened all at once. The ship dropped out of time travel mode and re-emerged into real space. All the controls on the console, which had been shut down for the time trip, now lit up. A large vision screen above the console winked into life, revealing a wide starscape and a single very large sun dead ahead of them. None of these things, however, were responsible for the fact that Zaphod was at the same moment hurled bodily backwards against the rear of the cabin, as were all of the others. They were hurled back by a single thunderous clap of noise that thudded out of the monitor speakers surrounding the vision screen. I hope you'll join us at the restaurant at the end of the universe when the next chapter drops very soon.